this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk about a boogie woogie. I'm going to play one. I'm Steve Benson. I'm Paul Schultz. And this is the Don't Panic Radio Show. Sit back, relax, and ignore the news. Nothing you're about to hear is true. Now here's something we hope you'll really like. The plan, the plan. They live the most my life living against us. Welcome to the show. Welcome, welcome, welcome. How you doing, Paul? I'm doing pretty good, Steve. How you doing? How you doing? All right, this week we're going to do a little behind the music uh, sort of, we're just going to talk about writing a little bit. It'll be exciting because we're working on the 2019 Christmas special, which sounded like a long way off until it became <laughs> March of <Yes>. 2019. <laughs> hey man, no pressure, no diamond. That's right. So, uh, you know, I've been thinking about story arcs mm-hmm. and layers, you know, like onions have layers. Right. Ogres have layers. Onions <laughs> have layers. Get it? What about parfaits? Parfaits have layers. <laughs> I don't get, you know, when you think about Shrek, because that's mm-hmm. obviously, as everyone knows, that's that's a quote from uh, Shrek. Yes. How come nobody ever complains that, that there's like a really jive-talking black dude that always is in these things? Like Madagascar has the jive-talking Chris Rock uh, zebra, and then Shrek has the jive-talking donkey. Mulan, Mulan had the uh, jive-talking dragon played by right. donkey. Say goodnight, donkey. Goodnight, donkey. Yeah, why does anybody ever complain about that? We do. We're just never heard. And now you and now Will Smith will be playing the genie in Aladdin, and of course he's going to be all Will Smith, right? <laughs> a movie no one will see. <laughs> I, I've watched a little bit of behind the scenes on that, and saw and seen some pictures for it. And I'm like, no one's going to watch that. <laughs> I think at the uh, at the end of his life, Will Smith will be on his deathbed, and somebody will say, "Do you have any regrets?" He'll be like, "Hey, Aladdin, maybe." <laughs> of course a zombie land reference not maybe i shouldn't have jumped up and pretended i was a zombie no he garfield maybe which is interesting because the thing that got me thinking about story arcs was the james altucher podcast mm-hmm. which is also where i heard uh, some talk about bill murray apparently there's a documentary out about bill murray yeah and they were talking about how he said that he decided from an early like early on in his life decided he was just going to behave as though he was fabulously wealthy. <laughs> <laughs> Not meaning like going places and buying things, but just like, I don't need this job. Yeah. You know, that kind of, <laughs> which I get. It's, it it's seems good. to have worked for him. So in terms of layers, you know, um, I was thinking about the different arcs. And, and the hero's journey arc is the one that has always sort of confused me a little bit mm-hmm. because you always hear it. Oh, it's a hero's journey. And when I hear hero's journey, I just think, oh, you mean like a hero, like a superhero? And it's not, right? The classic one is, what's his name? Odysseus or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. He's leading a normal life and somebody's like, oh, you got to go fight this Trojan war. And he's like, I don't want to. <laughs> I'm like, no, you have to. And then he goes off and some there's some instigating event right Mm -hmm. whatever it's called that activates him and causes him to go off and have this fantastic adventure right Mm -hmm. so he at first he refuses then he accepts and then he runs off has an adventure and comes full circle but doesn't actually go full circle yeah because he's he's changed Mm -hmm. and in any good story the character is changed right and so if offered the opportunity to go back they wouldn't take it which is part of the sort of sorrowful nature of it as well right like okay he went off he had this adventure and then his whole goal was just to get back home right 
he almost gets home. He can see home, but then he can't quite get home. And I think the metaphor or the, the whatever, the allegory or whatever it is, is that once you – it's sort of like Bilbo Baggins, right? Once you take that first step away from your door, if you don't mm-hmm. watch your feet, you know, who knows where you'll end up. And Bilbo <laughs> can never really go back right. to the Shire and live the life that he had before. Of quiet comfort and eggs and bacon and hot butter. and Yeah. It's one of those things, like, I try to, like, going through all the stuff that people are sick of hearing me talk about, the trial stuff. I sometimes, like, one of the things that will tear you apart is if you think that you can ever go back to the way things were. So as you think about the hero- hero's journey, uh-huh. you know, there's an instigating event. The reluctant hero then goes off on the journey, the adventure. You have this mm-hmm. great adventure. The whole time thinking the goal is to accomplish something, to overcome something mm-hmm. in order to get back home. But in the end, there is no going back home because... Right. By doing the adventure, you are changed. And so the reason I I say all that is when when I was messaging you, I messaged you like a thought on what will Clarence and Cooper have become, right? How will they have changed? What will Mm -hmm. be different about them at the Mm -hmm. end of the story? And the great thing about a good story is – you can you can tell people how they will have you can tell everyone okay here's how they will have changed and you won't have spoiled a thing <laughs> take luke skywalker right mm-hmm. um you know just some like like they said in the podcast you and i listened to the james altucher one mm-hmm. you know just leading an ordinary boring life as a sand farmer i don't know what they were growing moisture were they growing moisture is that what they were growing on that uh tatooine yeah so instigating event his aunt and uncle Mm-hmm. killed horribly and reluctantly he he doesn't want to so he ends up in yoda's swamp right <laughs> he, he doesn't really want to be the hero but he ends up being the hero and obviously he's changed and so you could tell somebody all right this luke skywalker guy he's the main character right and i'm not going to spoil anything for your star <laughs> wars experience but this there's this for future generations, there's that this haven't character, seen it yet. this Luke Skywalker character, and by the end of it, he, you know, he's this hero, right? He he's changed. He's now he now realizes the responsibility he has, even though in the beginning he's re- reluctant to take on that responsibility. He doesn't want to be the hero, but he ends up being the hero. If you had told that to some if, to nine year old Paul, were you nine when you saw it? Ten. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If I had told that to nine, 10 year old Paul Schultz, I would not have ruined the movie for you. Right. You wouldn't have said, no. Oh dude, spoiler alert. Yeah. You know, now if I'd said, uh, you know, spoiler alert, Darth Vader is Luke's dad. That would ruin it. Right. So the point being, I'm not going to give away anything and you can cut it out if you think it's a spoiler, but in our Christmas special, we've got these two main characters, obviously Cooper being the, the main hero, Clarence being, dude, you got it all wrong. Clarence is the hero, <laughs> at least the way I, the, at least the way I'm reading it. I don't know. I haven't read it yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, got these guys, and their life has been kind of shit so far, mm-hmm. and they've not been able to live up to their father's, what they perceive to be their father's expectations. Mm-hmm. Their fathers had dreams for them, they think. Mm-hmm. And they haven't been able to fulfill them, right? So it starts out as a slice of life, you know, day in the life of. Happens to be a big snowstorm. There's this, like, backdrop of we think there are some escaped convicts, which the astute listener will immediately go, oh, yeah, they're going to be involved somehow <laughs> later, right? And then the they continue to be reluctant. That, that's the part I'm trying to figure out. Is hmm. so they go to the they go to the party. Mm-hmm. What is the instigating event? I think it's I think it's after the party. You know what I mean? I think it's at I think it's at the house. 
Yeah, yeah. Something, they see something at the house, something happened that causes them to spring into action. That's where Pressfield was talking about how the character goes from in Act 1, he's in the normal world, then something happens, then in Act 2, he gets thrust into the super normal. Yeah. And that's that's the point that they're at in Act 2. Yeah. So there's, a, there's a catalyst at the house. Yeah, and I, I was thinking about Stranger Things, too, where you... You know, you watch, like, it's interesting how, and I'm jumping all over. I hope the listeners are following all nine of them. <laughs> it's, if you think Take about. Take notes. There's going to be a test later. Yeah. I was thinking about this in context of Stranger Things because I can't wait for the next season. July and, 4th. And I've known, yeah. And I've known that I, that I like the show mm-hmm. for some reason. And the more I try to put it in context of well-written stories the more i go oh yeah it's because it's a well-written story but mm-hmm. series like like uh, netflix series hulu series whatever amazon prime series are interesting because the arc has to go over multiple episodes mm-hmm. and in stranger things it's normal for a while if you don't really know what's coming like i didn't like, like once they start, once the instigating event happens and you go into act two, basically, it's, you just go, wow, whoa, hey, <laughs> right? And the crazy thing is we're talking about act two starting like four or five episodes into a season. Uh-huh. And so I, I think I probably got to go back and rewatch like season one, season two. Especially Uh season one. Yeah. Because based on what I've learned and based on what I know, you will never get to episode two if you don't follow basic storytelling structure in episode one. Right. People just won't watch episode two. They'll go, eh, wasn't that good. Didn't didn't hook me. Right? Right. So I need to go back and and figure out, because what I'm trying to say is there was an act one, an act two, and an act three. In episode one, uh-huh. there had to be. Otherwise, I, I would have walked away from that. There was. I guess you're. I guess you're right because that's where he meets the girl, right? Uh-huh. Ah, I just had an idea. Ooh, mm. Ah, Saint Charles. Ooh, ah. <laughs> Saint Char- <laughs> I haven't pulled that out in a while. No, <laughs> it's been a minute. <laughs> July fourth, huh? Uh-huh. So maybe we need to go back and, and like rewatch some of Stranger Things up seasons one and two, and bring some commentary to the show. You know what I mean? Oh, I plan. I I totally plan on it soon, because I want to. I want to brush up on it all. You know, before season three comes out. I'll do that. Instead of speculating, I'll just say, I'm sure there was Act One, Two, and Three in each episode. That's the beauty of a series, is. They have to do Act 1, 2, and 3 in each episode, but there has to be a broader arc and yeah. Act 1 to the season and Act 2 to the season and Act 3 to the season, you know? I don't follow along behind the three-act play thing quite so rigorously, and I don't even really follow it so much or, or look for it when I'm watching or reading something. Mm-hmm. I just need a hook. In the first couple of pages, I need a hook, or the first couple of minutes. And then some interesting characters. And then, yeah, then when you go back and you look at the thing as a whole, you'll see the three acts. But I don't, like, look for the acts to happen. I guess very few people do. I mean, nobody, like, I almost said nobody does, but I'm sure there's some weirdo out there that does, right? It's sort of like, like, I, I, I think about it, like, in terms of classical music. Mm-hmm. Nobody... Again, when I say nobody, I mean very few people. You're you're exaggerating to prove a point. Nobody sits and listens to a great piece of classical music and goes, "Okay, well, I'm going to listen for the the chord progression." And there's got to be in the in this style, this Baroque style. There's got to be, you know, this movement followed by that movement. And I've got to. And if I don't hear it, I'm not listening. No, you just sit down, put your earbuds in. And you listen, and you're like, yeah, this is good. This is good. And then once you know it's good, now maybe you'll go back and study it. Or a painting. You know, you walk up to a painting in a museum, a great, say, uh, a Degas or something, you know, and you look at it. Or, or let's pick uh, somebody I know a little bit more about, Monet. 
Let's say yeah, Monet. you see a great Monet painting, right? And you just stand there and you just experience it, right? And then you might maybe take a step back and say, okay, I'm going to analyze it now. I'm going to like look at the brush strokes and I'm going to look at the, mm-hmm. the color combinations and all that. So I think story is the same way. If, if, we, if we're talking about Stranger Things, you just you start watching it and you go, oh, man, I'm hooked and it's great. And then the second episode was good, too. And then I watched the whole season and they had me the whole time and it was great. And it's only shows like this that'll go back and say, all right, well, <laughs> let's use this three act sort of over, uh, structure overlay or even hero's journey to try to understand it. I guess that's the thing is it's not the truth. Mm-hmm. it's not a template that you lay down and then go, okay, I'm going to put the pieces of the story into the template to build the story. Mm-hmm. It's just more of a way of under, it's a model model is the word I was looking for. Mm-hmm. It's a model to help you try to understand why do some stories work and some don't. Yeah. And when I look at us and in, in writing the Christmas special, I think it's also a way for us to sort of check and see instead of just writing what we feel and just like going, uh-huh. Oh man, and I'm doing this with my eyes closed, my eyeballs raised, man, <laughs> I don't follow any structure. I just sit down and I write what I feel, man. And uh-huh. if people like it, they like it. And if they don't, they don't like, instead of doing that, we could kind of go, well, let's take a, let's write freely edit sober, but write drunk. <laughs> let's write freely. But then as we take a look at, making the edits and trying to make it better and better Uh and something people will actually enjoy. Why not borrow from the models that people have and that people have talked about and try to make it work within that context? You know what I mean? Oh yeah. The other challenge with it for me is writing with another person (laughs) because, (laughs) you know, writing has always been a solo bubble act for me. Mm-hmm. And you know, co-writing something is just like, well, how do how do people co-write? Well, they apparently co-write like this because this is what we're doing. <laughs> yeah, I th- the few thing, the the two or three things so far that I've that I've discovered that I didn't realize would be so fun. One is having, okay, first of all, having a deadline. Mm-hmm. I get why you artist types like having a deadline. <laughs> it's true. The, the problem right now is I got other things on my plate. But once that thing's done, these the deadline thing will work. Yep. Like, like we've had a couple deadlines that I've missed in the past month. But I got this other thing on my plate uh-huh. that I got to take care of. Once that's taken care of, the deadline thing's going to work. The other thing was... Well, you're a pretty fast writer anyway. I, I tend to be. If I sit down and concentrate, it's, it's like working out. I dread it. <laughs> You know, it's like exercising. Yeah. I dread it until I get about 10 minutes into it. And then, then mm-hmm. it just goes, right? Mm-hmm. But it's it's that spinning up part that's so hard for me. It's like the sitting mm-hmm. down and going, and I'm just like, oh, this sucks. I can't do this. This is horrible. 10 minutes later, <laughs> I'm like, it's just free flow, right? Don't talk to me. I'm busy. That's that's how I feel house painting. <laughs> really? Yeah. I, I loathe. <laughs> The whole I dread setting everything up. I I dread getting everything together, clearing the room or whatever. I just hate it. And then I get about three or four, you know, roller, you know, strokes into it. And I'm in a zone, and two hours later or whatever, I'm done with it. I don't even know where the time went. I think my wife must be that way too, because sometimes she'll start she'll paint a room or whatever, mm-hmm. and the way it kind of goes is she'll talk about it for a long time. And mm-hmm. I'll go, really? You really want to do that? And I'll discourage her because cause I don't want to have to be involved. Oh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but <laughs> one day I'll come home and a room will be painted, right? Mm-hmm. And I'll be like, what What happened here? And she's like, well, I got tired of waiting for you. I got tired of talking about it. Decided to do it, right? So I think probably what happens is she just runs out, buys the paint, brings it home. You know, <laughs> so your plan works. <laughs> I think calling it a plan is is maybe being generous. <laughs> so if you think about Cooper and 
clearance. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll tell everybody everything they need to know, and they won't even need to listen. They start thinking about their fathers, thinking in their entire life they've been trying to live up to the dreams of their fathers. By the end of the story, they realize, and, and they will have, this is the thing. How will they have changed? They, ha they will have let go of the dreams of their fathers. And they will have realized that it's their own dreams that matter. Mm -hmm. And I think that's it. And, and, you know, when I was talking about the ending scene, the mm -hmm. reason that I, the reason I talked about the ending scene in the way I did was I l really liked what Pressfield said in that episode. Uh, Pressfield, mm -hmm. by the way, author of a fantastic book, in my opinion, called the war of art. And he, and he talks about the entire writing process and he, he does use the three act uh, model like mm -hmm. to the three act template to describe it um but he also also the author of the legend of bagger vance right right and scores of other books too yeah. and and movie scripts and you name it he talked about how in in the hero's journey like the the end is a mirror image of the beginning right which is why i talked about what if they're they may, if they're still alive at the end, <laughs> see, see, I'm not giving everything away. That's right. If they're both still alive at the end, if they're riding along, listening to the radio, right? But everything's different mm -hmm. except for it's a mirror image of the beginning. So without giving anything away, I just like the idea of whether it's a an epilogue or the end of act three or scene, whatever. Mm-hmm. Something is revealed about these two guys in the very last scene where everybody's like, I get how they're changed. Or they may not say that. Right. People may not say that. They may just go, oh, that was a cool ending, right? But the, but it's similar. Like, go back to the classical music thing. People might, people might listen to a song and just go, oh, my God, that was so great. I feel so great about that song I just listened to, right? They don't know that the reason is that they resolved a chord at the end. Right. You know, that, that they that they built up suspension in the chord progression and the chord structure, and then they resolved it at the very end. And then that's the reason you feel great about it. People aren't going to sit there and say that. They're just going to go, oh, my God, that was so great. Right? So that's what I'm looking for is a scene at the end uh -huh. that follows some sort of hero's journey structure or model so that the listeners once they hear it just go wow that was so good and now i can't wait to hear the the next the next installment of the adventures of cooper and clarence <laughs> <laughs> cooper and clarence go to mars cooper and clarence in a basketball tournament cooper and clarence in space 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah because you always got to have the shitty sequels yeah, it's especially when dealing with the 80s, you know, you have First Blood and then you have all the shitty sequels, you know, <laughs> if ever there was a model. And then eventually, of course, we have to have the prequels where Clarence and Cooper are like eight. And it's like, oh. <laughs> what would they be like in the 70s? And like, <laughs> and there they are in the 70s. <laughs> I've actually thought about that already, so. <laughs> They're like running around the woods in the great acorn fight of Springfield Township. <laughs> <laughs> what well, what I think is funny when I was talking about working with someone else, writing with someone else, the the interesting thing for me is how in 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 the beginning, not on purpose, but at least not on my part, but the characters are both talking about their dads. Yeah. That wasn't that wasn't when I sat down and, and was hammering out you know my end of it. That wasn't my plan at all. But somehow it's like that's right. I talked about a few things, and I the only thing I mentioned was the deadline thing. Right. The other thing is exactly that. Like when you see what somebody else is writing in their dialogue, and you start to play off of it, you start to pick it up and like run with it. Mm -hmm. You start to discover the common features. It's like. Holy shit! We both have this thing about our dads. I mean, I mean, I mean, Cooper and Clarence do, obviously, not not us. Well, we're, exactly. We're, we're fine. Yeah. 
We're fine. We're perfect. Like, if we were honest, it would be about our moms. Right? <laughs> I think I think the version of ourselves, like, there's some version of us that we, you and I mean, not Clarence and Cooper, mm. but you and I, like, there's some version of us that wishes that we cared, like, that our dads had more influence in our life than our moms. <laughs> <laughs> but but our moms are more approachable, so... Any any writer who says they don't put a little a little of themselves into their characters is a bold faced liar. There's something about them in, in in all the characters that they create. Right. So right. So the other thing, one of the other things, there's, there's been many, but one of the other things that we we kind of mutually discovered that was kind of fun is when we just said, um, well let's let's just record. Let's do the spoken version of a rough draft, right? And we uh-huh. just started doing like the the opening scene, and <clears throat> like, wow, well, what what does this have to do with that? What does that have to do with this? It's, well, I don't know. Let's just try it. Then we just kind of start talking, and and suddenly I'm in the zone, like like Will Ferrell on Old School when he did the ribbon dance. <laughs> or no, not the ribbon dance. It was when he did yes. the debate. <laughs> He's like, what? What What happened? Mm. I blacked out. I think that is a fun, interesting co-writing moment, you know? Yeah. So so listeners, uh, dear listeners, that whole scene where Clarence is sort of remembering the King of the Hill incident and getting in a fight with all the sixth graders, that was written in a brainstorming session. Which, by the way, the listeners have never heard. Have they not heard that yet? No, okay. that comes... <laughs> right. And that's all I have to say about that. For Clarence and Cooper, and for Paul Schultz, I'm Steve Vinson. Nothing. You just heard. You just heard. You just heard. That's what we keep inside. That's what we keep inside. Sometimes, Mouse, you think you know people and then you don't. Then you wonder, have I met them before? But it doesn't matter. You're just information. That's what we keep inside our heads.